reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. In talking to you, you really neglected, and I would like to repair that neglect, going back to your experiences in England, first mm. at the London School, yes. where you met Lionel Robbins. Mm. Well, Robbins, of course, got me to the London School of Economics. I didn't know him before. But he got very interested in uh, an essay I had done criticizing. Do you remember the names of Foster and Catchings? Yes. Uh, well, I had Waddle written. Catchings. Yes. I had written an essay called The Paradox of Saving, which fascinated Robbins, who asked me to give these lectures on prices and production that led to my appointment. And we found that Robbins and I were thinking very much on the same lines. He became my closest friend, even still is, although we see each other very rarely now. And for ten years we were collaborating very closely. I mean, the center of teaching in London School of Economics was our joint seminar. And uh, Robbins, unfortunately, before he had achieved what he ought to have done, he might have written the textbook for this generation. And he had it already when he but the outbreak of war was drawn into government service. That's a real tragedy in the history of economics. And up to a point, he has since become a statesman as much as an economist, and uh, I don't think he any longer would want to do this sort of thing. Would but this have been a textbook on the price system? Yes, on a, a just a th uh, textbook of economic theory, essentially of the functioning of the market. And he was a brilliant teacher. I mean, a real master of his subject, unlike the English of that period, not at all insular. He really knew the literature of the world. And uh, in a sense, modern economics is his creation by what was then a number of diverse schools, the English tradition of Marshall, the Swedish tradition, the Austrian tradition, bringing all this together. And he did it very effectively in his lectures, which were masterly. And if that had been turned into a textbook, it might have changed the development of economics. Unfortunately, war came and he never did it. Was Alfred Marshall much of an influence on you? Not at all. By the time I came to read Marshall, I was a fully trained economist in the Austrian tradition, and was never particularly attracted by Marshall. I, many other I later discovered Wicksteed, who was a very important English economist. I was more influenced by the, if influenced, by some of the Americans, uh, John Bates Clark and yeah. uh, uh, Fetter and that group. But Marshall never really appealed to me. I think this uh, somewhat timid acceptance of the marginal utility approach, the famous two sisters affair, it's partly cost and so on, and also his kind of analysis of the market positions did not appeal to me. How did you get on with Beveridge? Had Beveridge written the Beveridge report by then? No, he never wrote it. He wasn't incapable of doing this. I have never known a man who knows an economist who knew, understood so little economics as he. He was very good in picking his skillful assistants. The main part, the report of unemployment, it's really been done by Nicholas Calder. And uh, I think Calder, through the beverage report, has done more to spread Keynesian thinking than almost anybody else. No, Cam uh, Beveridge, who was a splendid organizer, well, what an organizer on him, because he wasn't even good at detail, but conceiving great plans, very formulating them, very impressive. Literally, you knew economics. He was the tip of a barrister who would prepare, give him a brief, would speak splendidly to it, and five minutes later have forgotten what it was all about. It's extraordinary. <laughs>
I mean, I can, everybody knows one famous story. Just as I came to London, they'd written the book on free trade, and then came in 31 the reversal of English policy, and he quite naively uh, turned to his friends, with whom he had just written a book on free trade, to, ought me now to write a book on tariffs? I thought uh, he, I thought he opposed tariffs. Oh, he had, I mean, the book on tariffs was opposed to it, but after the 1931 change, he suddenly thought that it might after all be a good thing to have little protection, and where the, his friends, of course, refused it. Oh, well, I don't mind putting this on the record now. There was an even more comic scene. Fortunately, he knew that he didn't know much economics, so when he made public speeches, to let, let Robbins or myself look through the draft. And even in the mid-30s, there was one proposal which was frightfully inflationary. So I pointed out to him, you see, if you do this, you get a great rise in prices. As usual, he took comment. Fortunately, I saw a second draft of the same lecture, which contains a sentence, as Professor Hayek has shown, an increase in the quantity of money tends, up to drive, uh, tends to drive up prices. This is very great new discovery. <laughs> when uh, Beveridge, uh, one could talk about a great length about this extraordinary person. What about the others at the London School, which were uh, very much in the Fabian tradition out of which you came in one way or another, such as Harold Lasky. Well, Harold Lasky, of course, uh, at that time had become a propagandist, very unstable in his opinions. Many of other people whom I greatly respected, like old Tony, I differed from him, but he was a sort of socialist saint. A you Americans call it do-gooder, in a slightly <laughs> ironic sense, but he was a man who really was only concerned with doing good. Uh, uh, my Fabian socialist, the prototype, but a very wise man. Uh, well, you're uh, talking about the acquisitive society, Tony. Yes, yes. And uh, Velasky, curiously enough, we had a good deal of contact because we were both passionate book collectors, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it was only that way otherwise. And he was frightfully offended by my road to serfdom. He, he was very egocentric and believed it was a book written specially against him. Really? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know economics? No, no, none at all. And as I say, he must have been a very acute thinker in his youth. But by the time I really came to know him, he had become a, not only a propagandist, but even the students. He still had the capacity of getting students excited at first, but even they noticed after two or three months, he was constantly repeating himself. And extraordinary, inconsistent, I know. In his private life, he was extremely <coughs> generous to the refugees. Uh, generous he to concealed refugees, generous his to his students. Yes. I mean, he would do anything to help his students, but uh, wholly unreliable in mean, both his stories and his uh, theoretical views. I mean, I was present uh, one evening in August 1939 <coughs> when he had held forth for half an hour about the marvels of communist achievement. Then we listened to the news and the story of the Hitler ribbon, the of the Ribbentrop Stalin uh, plant came through, and when we finished the news, he turns against communism, denounced them. He had never said a word in their favor before. <laughs> it is amazing. Now, this was the period, of course, when John Maynard Keynes was coming into oh, international yes. repute, and I'd love you to talk about him. Well, I knew him very well, uh, even. I made his acquaintance even before I had come to England in 28 at the meeting of the Trade Cycle Research Institute, when we had our first difference on economics, uh, on the rate of interest characteristically, and he had a habit of going like a steamroller, a young man who opposed him. But if you stood up against him, he respected uh, you for the rest of your life. And we remained, although we differed on economics, friends to the end. In fact, I 
owed to him that I spent the war, t the war years at King's College, Cambridge. He got me rooms there and we talked on a great many things, but we had learned to avoid economics. You avoided economics? I avoided economics. But you took on the general theory, didn't you, the book, what it appeared? No, I didn't. I had spent a great deal of time reviewing his treatise on money. Money. And what prevented me from returning to the charge is when I published the second part of my very long examination of that book, it took me, oh, I no longer believe in all this. He but said so? Yes. <laughs> How much later was this? It was 33, uh, 32, and the book came out in 30, the treatise. And he was already then on the lines towards the general the theory. theory. And he still had replied to my first part, and when six months later the second part came out, he just said, oh, never mind, I no longer believe in this. That's very discouraging for a young man who spent a year criticizing a major work. And I rather expected that when he brought out the general theory, he would again change his mind in another year or two. So I thought it wasn't worthwhile investing as much work, and of course that became the frightfully important book. I mean, it's one of the things which I reproach myself, because I'm quite convinced I could have pointed out some mistakes of that book at that time, but I didn't want to have the same experience a second time. Well, did you seriously think that he would say, oh, I no longer believe in the trade-off between unemployment and so on? Uh, I think, I'm sure he would have uh, you, you modified, he he modified his ideas. In fact, my last experience with him, and I saw him last, say, six weeks before his death, and uh, that was after the war, when I asked him whether he wasn't alarmed about uh, what his pupils did with his ideas in a time when inflation was already the main danger. And his answer was, oh, never mind, you know, my ideas were frightfully important in the depression of the 1930s, but you can trust me, if they ever become dangerous, I'm going to turn public opinion around like this. Six weeks later he was dead and couldn't do it. I'm convinced Keynes would have become one of the great fighters against inflation. Do you think he could have done it? Oh yes. He wouldn't have had the slightest hesitation. So the only thing I blame him for is that what he knew was a pamphlet for the time to counteract the deflationary tendencies in the 1930s. He called a general theory. It was not a general theory, it was really a pamphlet for the situation at a particular time. Partly under the influence of some of his very doctrinaire disciples who pushed him. See, in, uh, there's a book, a recent essay by Joan Robinson, one of his disciples, in which she quite frankly says, we sometimes had great difficulty in making Maynard see the implications of his theory. I'm interested in the fact that you think it would have been that easy to have reversed opinion coming out of a deflationary period. Well, I don't think so, but Keynes... Yes, oh, well, he thought so, I see. Keynes had a supreme conceit of his power of playing with public opinion. And you know, he had done the trick about the peace treaty. Yes. And ever since, he really believed he could play with public opinion as if on an instrument. And for that reason, he wasn't at all alarmed by the fact that his ideas were misinterpreted. Oh, I can correct this any time. That was his feeling about it. It did not upset him when his, his oh, no. name or authority was used? He had a great influence on politicians, didn't he? Uh, more in this country even than in, the, in England. Uh, he had gained great influence in his capacity during the war when he's advising the government, but and of course then he did essentially draw up the Bretton Woods Agreement. Yes. So in the end he had become very powerful, but of course till the war he partly was a protester and partly liked the pose of being disregarded and neglected by official opinion. In the United States, he was in Washington, and when he left the White House, he had already mm -hmm. talked to the Secretary of the Treasury, Morgan, and so on, but he made the politically indiscreet uh, remark, which went around all of Washington, that he was quite surprised by how little 
President Roosevelt knew about economics. Surprised, <laughs> he said. <laughs> yes, I think this was a very deliberate indiscretion. <laughs> you think he said that intentionally? Was he given to that? Uh, well, I know he had such a low opinion of the economic knowledge of politicians generally that he cannot really have been surprised. How do you think he will rank in the history of economic theory or thought? As a man with a great many ideas who knew very little economics, and that's literally true. So he knew nothing but Marshallian economics. He was completely unaware of what was going on elsewhere. He even knew very little about 19th century economic history. His uh, interests were very largely guided by aesthetic appeal. And he hated the 19th century, and therefore knew very little about it even about its scientific literature. He was a really great expert in the Elizabethan age. I'm <laughs> absolutely astounded that you say that John Maynard Keynes really didn't know the economic literature. Oh, he had sure very little. Gone very little. Uh, even within the English tradition, he did know very little of the great monetary writers of the 19th century. He would know nothing about Henry Thornton. He would know he knew a little about Ricardo, of course, the famous things, but uh, he could have found any number of antecedents of his inflationary ideas in the 1820s and 1830s, and when I told him about it, it was all new to him. How did he react? Was he sheepish? Was oh, he? no, not in the least. Uh, he was much too self-assured and... Uh, amused? Uh, convinced that uh, what other people could have said about the subject was not frightfully important. When, uh, at the end, well not in the end, there was a period just after he'd written the general theory where he was so convinced he had redone the whole science that he was rather contemptuous of anything which had been done before. And did he maintain that confidence to the end? I can't say, because as I said before, we'd almost stopped talking economics. A uh, great many other subjects, uh, his general history of ideas and so on, we were interested. And, you know, I, I don't want you to uh, get the impression that I underestimated him as a brain. He was one of the most intelligent and most original thinkers I have known. But economics was just a sideline for him. And he had an amazing memory. He was extraordinarily widely read. But economics was not really his main in but his own economics was he was convinced he could recreate the subject. And he rather had contempt for most of the other economists. Does this tie in with your two kinds of minds you wrote in Encounter some years ago? Uh, piece that but curiously enough, me. I would say Keynes was rather my type of mind, no, then not the other. He certainly could not have been described as a master of his subject, which I yes, time yes, described yes. the other time. He was an intuitive thinker with a very wide knowledge in many fields, who had never felt that uh, economics was weighty enough to. He just took it for granted that. Marshall's textbook contained everything one need to know about the subject. There was a certain arrogance of Cambridge economics about me, and they thought they were the center of the world. And if you have learned Cambridge economics, there was yes. nothing else worth learning. Mm -hmm. What was their reaction to the road to serfdom? Well, Keynes, of course, took it extraordinarily kindly. He wrote a letter to me, a very remarkable letter to me, but he, I think, was the only one in Cambridge who took that. I think shows very clearly the difference between him and his doctrinaire pupils. His pupils were really all socialists, more or less, and Keynes was not. What all was he? <laughs> How would you describe him politically? I think there the American usage of the term liberal is fairly right fairly close to what he was. He wanted a controlled capitalism. Yes. And he thought that he could control it. Oh, yes. Or yeah. at least advise those in power. 
Is it true that he said, I am no longer a Keynesian? I haven't heard him say so. It's quite likely. But uh, after all the Keynesianism spread only just about the time of his death. You mustn't forget he died as early as 46. Mm -hmm. Just as the thing became generally accepted. In fact, uh, I sometimes say it, his death made him a saint mm -hmm. whose uh, word was not to be criticized. Mm -hmm. If Keynes had lived, he would greatly have modified his own idea. As he always was changing opinion, he would never have stuck to this particular set of beliefs. And he could argue with him. Uh, I mean, uh, since we were speaking about him, curious enough, the two persons I found most interesting to talk to for an evening were Keynes and Schumpeter. Yes. Two economists who were the best conversationalists and the most widely educated people in general terms I knew. With the difference that Schumpeter knew the history of economics intimately and Keynes did not. Had Keynes read Schumpeter? I would assume yes, but he wasn't reading much contemporary economics either. He probably had an idea, probably had... Yes, I, I'm sure he is. Well, I'm not only sure, I have seen them together. Mm -hmm. So I know he knew Schumpeter, and, uh, but I doubt whether he has uh, carefully studied any of Schumpeter's. Schumpeter's uh, book, which we mentioned before, Capitalism, came out in wartime when he yes. was much too busy to read anything of the kind. And Schumpeter's earlier works, I would suspect Keynes had read the brochure Schumpeter wrote in money because that was in his immediate field, but probably nothing else. I'm interested in your earlier comment about the fact that here is a man of immense intelligence, uh. great imagination, mm. wide learning and so on, and yet was not an economist. And I'm not clear whether you mean he didn't have the kind of mind that excels in economics, just as mathematics say you can find people who are brilliant, but who, given mathematics, are just hopeless. But do you mean he didn't have the kind of mind that makes for first-rate oh, yeah. economists? Oh, he had. I mean, if he had given his whole mind to economics, he could have become a master of economics, of the existing body. But there were certain parts of economic theory which, had, which he had never been interested in. He had never thought about the theory of capital. He was very shaky on, even on the theory of international trade. He was well informed on contemporary monetary theory, but even there he did not, not know such things as Henry Thornton or Wicksell. And of course his great effect was he didn't read any foreign language except French. The whole German literature was inaccessible to him. He did, curious enough, review Mises' book on money, mm -hmm. but uh, later admitting that in German he could only understand what he knew already. So what he had known before he read the book. <laughs> How would you distinguish the streams that economics took in Austria and Sweden and England during your time? Well, in England, unfortunately, Sweden and Austria were moving on parallel lines. And if Jevons had lived, or his extraordinarily brilliant pupil, Wicksteed, had had more influence, the development was in the same direction. But uh, Marshall established almost a monopoly. Uh, and by the time I came to England, with the exception of the London School of Economics, where Edwin Cannon had created a different position, and Robbins was one of the few economists who knew the literature of the world, who drew on everything, England was dominated by Marshallian thinking. And this idea that if you knew Marshall, there's nothing else worth reading, was very widespread. Now, what happened when you came to the University of Chicago? How did you find that? Well, I was in Chicago not in the economics department, I was in the Committee on Social Thought. And I greatly welcomed this because I had become a little tired of a uh, purely economic atmosphere like the School of Economics. I wanted to branch out and to be offered a position uh, 
to be concerned with any borderline subject in the social science. It was just what I wanted. But uh, there were two people. Well, uh, when I came to Chicago, Jacques Weiner had already left, but yeah. I had known him before there, and it was his influence as much as Frank Knight's influence. So on the whole, I found there this very sympathetic group of uh, Milton Friedman and uh, soon George Stigler. So I was with part of the department on very good terms, but it was uh, numerically, it was the econometricians who, demonstra who dominated them. The Carl's Commission was then yes. situated in Chicago, so the predominant group of Chicago economists had really very little in common. It's this Frank Knight and his group who were the people with whom I got along well. Frank Knight was a remarkable person yes. and he was at heart an anarchist. I mean, his, his contempt for all forms of government or the intelligence or the capacity of people to manage things was such that he seemed to me to end up as a kind of a philosophical anarchist. Yes, of course, I knew no person more difficult to describe and who was capable of taking the most unexpected positions on almost anything. But he was extraordinarily stimulating even in conversation and his influence was wholly beneficial. And it's hardly an exaggeration to say that all the leading economic theorists in this country above the age of 50 or even 45 come out of Frank Knight tradition, even more than the Harvard. Earlier it was the Taussig tradition in Harvard. Harvard yes. But in that generation, which is slightly younger than myself, I think nearly all the first-class economists at one time or another have been pupils of, uh, pupils of Frank Nash. And yet, as I remember, he only wrote one book, what, Risk, Uncertainty and Profit. Yes, all the other are collections book. of essays. Yes. Did you know that he once gave a lecture entitled Why I Am a Communist? I've heard that, yes. I <laughs> it was one of the most hilarious experiences I had because we couldn't believe our eyes or ears when uh, uh. we heard this. And what it came down to was the fact that the country was going to ruin so fast mm -hmm. and that the growth of governmental power was so great and the uh, veneration of people for politicians and the New Deal that only a strong communist threat could awaken the American <laughs> people to the need for change and the growth of a conservative movement. I've heard him later take a very similar position again, then to my complete surprise, and was that occasion that I was told about the earlier lecture. But uh, he was completely unpredictable what position he would t take. <laughs> now, I will tell you one amusing episode about Frank Knight. When I had called that first meeting on Mont Pelerin, which led to the formation of the Mont Pelerin Society, I'd also had the idea we might turn this into a permanent society, and I proposed it should be called the Acton Tocqueville Society. The two figures seemed most representative. Frank Knight was up with greatest indignation. You can't call a liberal movement up to Catholics. Oh, and he completely defeated him. It's impossible. How interesting. As a single person, he absolutely obstructed the idea of using these two names yes. merely because they were Roman Catholics. Well, he was a Midwesterner and he had a kind of a dry and original way of thinking. Uh. You knew Viner. Oh, yes, I knew him quite well. Isn't it interesting to you that Viner wrote three papers, I believe, in which he demolished the then current theory that wars are caused by governments protecting private profits. Yes, yes. And he did this extraordinary piece yes, of research yes, yes. in England, France, Russia, and Germany yes, yes. on the origins of the First World War, and in effect pointed out it was exactly the opposite. Hmm. How did that, really a, a, a revolution in thinking and a breakthrough in research, why didn't that have a greater effect? I don't know. In general, Weiner, who was one of the most knowledgeable persons and most sensible persons, has an extraordinarily little effect on the literature. And to my great regret, I'm told that the manuscripts of three books on which he was working for his last years are not usable for some reason or other. He seems to have himself become a little 
uncertain. Incidentally, since you have read these essays of mine, of two types of mine, I didn't mention in that essay, but the contrast between Knight and Weiner seemed to me an ideal yes. illustration of the case. Yes. I mean, Weiner was a perfect master of his subject, as great a master of the whole subject as anyone I knew. And, of course, uh, Knight was very much the, what I called the muddle hand. <laughs> well, from the uh, way you describe Frank Knight, he was a kind of hick John Maynard Keynes. That is a kind of a Midwestern uh, yeah, rover. Uh, yes, yes. He uh, had a remarkable founding or basis in philosophy, for example. Uh, yes. But he surprised you. He would always come up. Because I studied under uh, all of the people uh, we've been talking about. I was lucky enough for that. He would always surprise you by coming up with a quotation from some very obscure philosopher of the Middle Ages about which he knew a great deal. Yeah. But you know, he also knew the history of economics very well. He knew exactly, in that respect, it was quite unlike Keynes. I mean, you could hardly mention an ancient or 19th century economist and Knight wouldn't know all about it. But it's not in the sense that he had made traditional theory his own that he automatically gave the official reply to any subject. I mean, there were some people who had no reason to think because it's the answer ready <laughs> on everything from the literature they had read. Frank Knight was one of the people who had to think through everything before he, or at least to form a You mean think idea. anew? I think anew, yes. That is an interesting comment. It gave him this quality that endeared him to students. Yeah of not answering off the cuff or, you know, if you press the button. On the contrary, he took students very seriously. He would get annoyed, he would argue, he would show his discontent, and then he would suddenly go into, but don't you realize the theological implications when you were talking about the Federal Reserve Bank or something? I don't know how early that was when I knew him in the 50s. Of course, he was preoccupied with religion, with all his fundamentally atheistic in the anti-religious attitude, his greatest interest was religion. He was agnostic, I would say, not an atheist. Yes. I mean, he was obviously a man who would refuse to take mm. as firm a position as saying, I know or there is no God, quite on the contrary. But it was also, just as his anarchism mm -hmm. came out, unlike Viner, Weiner was all of a piece. Oh, yes. And yes. he was enormously homogeneous very and wide much, ranging in his thought. Uh, I sometimes had, uh, was driven once in a similar discussion about the two men. I described both as wise. And then I found it was using wise in altogether different senses in describing the one and the other. Uh, I find it very difficult to define it, but. Uh, I would say that, in a sense, Frank Knight was a more profound but much less systematic thinker, while uh, Weiner had a rounded system where he attempted to reconcile everything with everything else. Weiner could have written a very good textbook. Yes. Yes. Course, incidentally, the first four chapters of uh, Risk, Uncertainty, Profits, which of course uh, Knight did when he was very young, or relatively young, was at that time the best summary of the current state of theory available anywhere. Uh, Robbins, when I came to London, was giving his students the first chapter of Risk, Uncertainty and Profits as an introduction into economic theory. It was then the best one which was available. Did you find the intellectual atmosphere at the University of Chicago wider, so to speak, than the London School of Economics. Well, there were interdisciplinary contacts. I mean, what I enjoyed in Chicago was returning into a general university atmosphere from the narrow atmosphere of a school devoted exclusively to social sciences. I mean, the faculty club, the quadrant club in Chicago, was a great attraction. Yes. Could sit with the historians on one day and with the physicists another day yes. and with the biologists on the third. In fact, I still know no other university where there is so much contact between the different subjects as in the University of Chicago. Or as much contact between the undergraduate student and the faculty. This is yes, remarkable. too. That tradition, I hear, is still maintained. 
but I should have thought that you would have found yourself returning to a more congenial In, in a sense, yes. I, I had become a little tired of economics after 20 years in, at the London School of Economics. And, of course, economics drove me into the examination of political problems. I had already come to the conclusion that with our present political constitution you could not expect governments to pursue a sensible economic policy. They were forced into something else, and that has occupied me ever since. Can you give me an example of why this didn't occur to you sooner? I mean, let me, let me put it this way. The, the constant argument, whether it's on a very high level or just a journalistic level, is the, the, the constant argument between the economist and, say, the sociologist, the economist and the political scientist, who say, you're not dealing with the model in the abstract. Mm. You can't say, well, that's a political problem, and therefore I have nothing to say about it. So surely you ran into the interferences with economics because of, you started, we started out early when you were talking about the way in which you were raised in a family, which I thought was a very vivid way of pointing out what is ultimately going to be a problem intellectually when you deal with what is called the real world. There is a real world. I think I was just taken in by the theoretical picture of what democracy was and that ultimately we had to put up with many miscarriages so long as we were governed by the predominant opinion of the majority. It's only when I became clear that there is no predominant opinion of the majority that the whole an artifact uh, achieved by paying off the interests of particular groups and this was inevitable with an omnipotent legislature that I dared to turn against the existing conception of democracy. And that took me a very long time. I mean, in fact, see, I've been mainly interested in borderline problems of economics and politics since, uh, well, since before the outbreak of war, 38, 39, when I had planned this book on the, what I was going to call the abuse and decline of reason, of which the counter-revolution of science, which I wrote is the beginning of the uh, rationalist abuse of uh, constructivism, as I now call it. And conceptually, I had a big book on the decline of reason ready, and I used the material. I prepared a book then to write the route to serfdom as a pamphlet applied to contemporary yeah. affairs. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really over the past 40 years that my main interest is a much broader than technical economics, but certainly gradually that I've been able to bring the things really together. And they arose out of concern with the same problems, but to treat it as a coherent uh, system, I've only succeeded in, I uh, think I'm just completing law, legislation and liberty. Did you find many of the political scientists responsive to what you were thinking and doing? Very few at the time. There, were one, there was one good man, not very original, but sensible at London School of Economics, Smelly, if you remember him. There are few now developing. There's a man now here, an Italian, Sartori, who has seen more or less the same problems. But I think the general answer is no. I had very little, little uh, co either contact with the political scientists or uh, sympathetic treatment of my ideas. But in the Committee on Social Thought, you certainly had sociologists like Ed Shields. I think he was then there, wasn't he? Yes, Ed Shields uh, was the only sociologist and was a very intelligent man. But he remained a puzzle to me to the end. I never quite... Uh, I mean, he's an extremely knowledgeable and well-informed man. You can talk with him on everything. But if he has a coherent conception of society, I've yet to discover it. He probably has, but I may be unjust. But he was the only sociologist with philosophers, with art historians, with, of course, the chairman was a very considerable economic historian, John Neff. Oh, yes. Uh, with an anthropologist, Redfield was one of our members. It was an extremely interesting crowd. There's a classical scholar, David Green, who was interested in the social ideas of the 
ancient Greeks. Oh, it was a fascinating group. And when, when my sister, the first seminar I held in uh, there, was one of the great experiences of my life. I announced in Chicago a seminar on scientific method, in particular differences between the natural and social sciences. And it attracted some of the most distinguished members of the faculty of Chicago. At Enrico Fermi and mm. Sewell Wright and a few people of that quality sitting in my seminar discussing the scientific method. And that was one of the most exciting experiences of my life. Do you find the newer, younger, so-called neoconservatives, whether Chicago or not, what do you think of them? Some of them have appeared in the Mont Pelerin Society. Oh, some of them. The economists among them are very good. Uh, I'm not so impressed by the people who think on these lines in political science and so on. But there are a few people now in philosophy still little known people who seem to be very good, so I am rather hoping that this idea are now spreading. Of course, there are, I think the main thing is there are economists who are working outside their fields, like Jim Buchanan in, uh, uh, oh, down there in South Carolina, and some of the people working in UCLA. I mean, uh, well, I said before that uh, you cannot be a good economist but, but except by being more than an economist. I think it's being recognized by more and more of the economists. This narrow specialization, particularly of the mathematical economists, uh, is, I believe, going out. Well, if you were to name five books, ten books, as you look back on your life, each of us does this. I was struck by the fact the other day reading someone who happened to read Huckleberry Finn at the age of nine mm. and said it was an experience from which I never recovered. Mm. But if you look back over your own background, your own readings, which five or ten books would you say most influenced your thinking? Well, it's a tall order yes. to do at a moment's notice. You're a tall man. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt that both Menger's uh, Grundsätze and Mises on Socialism. Menger at once absorbed Mises is a book with which I struggled for years and years because I came to the conclusion that his conclusions were almost invariably right but wasn't always satisfied by his arguments. But uh, he had probably as great an influence on me than any person I know. In, uh, on political ideas, I think the same is true of the two men I mentioned before, another connection, Tocqueville and Lord Axton. Yeah. Do you know how long to Tocqueville was in the United States? Well, no, I did know. I used this. I, I've read the diary a few months. Unbelievable, uh, uh, yes. And, of course, <laughs> I will say, as a description of contemporary America, that great book is probably not a very good book. It's extraordinarily prophetic. He has seen tendencies which only uh, became really effective much later than he wrote. Let me go back to something you just said, which interested me very much, on uh, Ludwig von Mises, when you said his c you agreed with his conclusions, but not with the reasoning by which he came to them. Now, on what basis would you agree with the conclusions, if not by his reasoning? Well, let me put this in a direct answer. I think I can explain. Mises remained to the end a strict rationalist and utilitarian. And he would put his argument in the form that man had deliberately chosen intelligent institutions. I'm convinced that men have never been intelligent enough for that, but these institutions have evolved by a process of selection, rather similar to biological selection, and that it was not our reason which helped us to build up uh, very effective system, but merely by trial and error. So I never could accept his, I would say, almost 18th century rationalism in his argument, nor his utilitarianism, because uh, in the original form, uh, if you say human Smith were utilitarians, they argued that the useful would be successful not that people 
designed things because they knew they were useful. Mm. It was only Bentham uh, who really turned it into a rationalist argument. And Mises was in that sense a successor of Bentham. He was a Benthamite utilitarian. And that utilitarianism I could never quite swallow. And I'm now, more or less, coming to the same conclusions by recognizing that uh, spontaneous growth, which led to the success of, to the selection of the successful, leads to formations which look as if they had been intelligently designed. But of course, they never have been intelligently designed, nor being understood by the people who really practice the things. So Freud did influence you in the sense that he ex exposed the enormous power of the not rational or of the rationalizing mechanisms for the expression of self-interest in the, in the uh, psychological sense. It may be, I'm certainly not aware of it, my reaction to Freud was always a negative one from the very beginning. I grew up in an atmosphere which was governed by a very great psychiatrist who was absolutely anti-Freudian, Wagner Jauric, the man who invented the treatment of uh, syphilis by malaria and so on, a Nobel Prize man. And in Vienna, Freud was never... Well, of course, that leads to very complicated issues, the division of Viennese society, the Jewish society, the non-Jewish sure. society. I grew up in the non-Jewish society, was wholly opposed to Freudianism, so was prejudiced before, <coughs> and then was so irritated by the manner in which the psychoanalysts argued <coughs> their insistence that they have a theory which could not be refuted, that my attitude was really anti-Freudian from the beginning, but uh, to the extent that he drew my attention to certain problems, yes. I have no doubt you're right. Yes. Uh, two comments on that. You know, Bertrand Russell's uh, famous statement that uh, it has been said, he didn't say Aristotle, but it has been said that man is a rational animal. Uh -huh. All my life I have been searching for evidence to support this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Russell? Oh, I knew him, yes, I have never heard this. I knew him fairly well. Oh, in the final years of the war, he was back in Cambridge, while I was still in Cambridge. I saw him even before he once came to talk to my seminar. And then I was in correspondence with him about Wittgenstein. Oh, yes. Uh, he, in fact, gave me the whole set of letters which Wittgenstein had written to him, and I had started writing a biography on Wittgenstein around these letters, when the literary executors stopped me, didn't give me permission to publish these letters before they had published them, and meantime I lost interest. I mean, I had a certain duty, because I was the only, I'm still the only person who knew Wittgenstein both in Vienna and in, uh, in London. See. You know, he was a cousin of mine, I just... No, I did not know. Oh, yes, it was certain, uh, second cousin of my mother, strictly speaking, and I did not hardly knew him in Vienna, but knew the family and the family yes. background and all that, and then was in contact with him in England. Yeah. Was he Jewish? Uh, Three-quarter. Uh, the common great-grandmother, uh, his and mine, was of a stern country family who married in this Jewish-Vienna connection. Oh, yes and uh, three of his grandparents were Jewish. You got interested in Wittgenstein then very early, before you were working on your, your material on, uh, uh, on philosophy. Yes. yes, I came, uh, <coughs> I read the Tractatus almost as soon as it appeared. Uh, just because I, the, my knowledge about him is curiously indirect. His eldest sister, who was second cousin, was also a very close friend of my mother. So this elderly lady, or it wasn't elderly then, was uh, talking frequently about her youngest brother, of whom they were, she was very fond. But he was just one of, uh, at that time, five Wittgenstein brothers, and later two, whom I didn't really know apart. I saw them as yes, distant relations. Yes. And I made his acquaintance. I wrote also an article about my recollection of Wittgenstein in Encounter. I met him in... The Bahnhof, the railway station of Bad Ischl, 
on uh, in August 1918, as we were both ensigns in the artillery in uniform, on the point of returning to the front. And the curious point, we traveled to Vienna together. It was the first time overnight that I really had a long conversation with him. But the point I have only sin remembered since I wrote that essay, that of course in the rucksack he carried, he carried already the manuscript of the Tractatus. Did he really? Uh, <coughs> no doubt he went to the front, <coughs> he was on the way to the front, and he was captured by the Italian with the Tractatus on him. I did not know that. <coughs> did, not know that. Mm -hmm. did Russell know any economics? No. He, no. Was he interested at all? No. Was very suspicious of it as a scientist. Why? He didn't think it was a scientific subject. I once asked him this question, which will mm. interest you because of the precision of his speech. I said, but just suppose that, much to all of our dismay, you left this earth and now found yourself standing before the throne, and there is the Lord in all of his radiance. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> and he looked at me as though I was some idiot. <laughs> I said, well, I would say, sir, why didn't you give me better evidence? <laughs> Which is quite typical yeah, of yeah, oh yes. At Chicago you found uh, a kind of uh, fellowship which included the physical scientists and the philosophers. You haven't mentioned many of the Chicago group of the philosophers. I don't know. Keyworth was the only one I was at all. The law school, did many of them come to your seminar? Uh, not much, really. I used to know cats fairly, fairly well. I used to know Levy, but uh, not well, really. Well, the one I knew fairly well was Einstein. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, uh, did Mortimer Adler play any part in this? No, he had left practical Chicago the year I arrived. <coughs> he was an influence in there, everyone talked about him. Yes. But in fact, I believe I've never encountered him in person. Oh, really? Yes. Well, he has tried to do, in a very different way, things on freedom and liberty, mm -hmm. but uh, with no, no foot in the... Uh, economic or mm. political structure, actually. It's much more legalistic and, and no, philosophical. No, I came across his influence rather via Hutchins. Yes. Hutchins I knew fairly well and uh, could see that Hutchins was relying on Adler in his ideas that made me read some of Adler's stuff. 